put all the screens, uh, or all the uh, scriptures up on the screen today. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we will be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. Today, I want to continue our series in Nehemiah called Rise Up. Today we're going to talk about rising up and building. Rising up and building. Let's bow and ask God to open our hearts one final time. Our Father, we ask that you would work now. I pray that you would, uh, Lord, speak to hearts today. Give me liberty to preach. And Lord, we have some festivities to follow. And so, uh, Lord, I don't want to be long-winded today. I pray you'll help me to say the words I need to say and uh, leave unsaid what you don't want me to speak. And I pray, Father, that you'll just guide us through this. Open the hearts of the people. Lord, we want to hear from you. And Lord, at the same time, we don't want to put you on a, on a time clock here. We're not limiting you. So I pray that you'll give us liberty and understanding and wisdom. And I pray you'll speak to our hearts now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm excited about this message today because I think it's the perfect message for Anniversary Sunday. In our first two messages in the series, Rise Up, we've laid out the context uh, to the story of Nehemiah. In chapter 1, we learned that Nehemiah rose up with a burden. Nehemiah, as we learned, was in Shushan, the palace. He uh, was in a place of comfort. He was in a place, really, where he had a position. He was in a place where he had prestige, and indeed, uh, he had power uh, in, in, as the cupbearer to the king in Shushan. And so Nehemiah was in that place of comfort, but then we learned that he was confronted by the reality that the Jewish people and Jerusalem was in ruins and, and that they were under great reproach. And God, after a season of prayer, puts it upon Nehemiah's heart to do something about the problem. And I really think that that is one of the key elements of the story of Nehemiah is the fact that Nehemiah, uh, he was a man of bold action. He was a man who saw the need and he went out of his way to meet the need uh, that was there in Jerusalem. And the question I think we need to be asking ourselves today is not, is there something to be done? But rather, am I going to do something about the brokenness that is all around us? Jesus said in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 2, Therefore said he, Jesus unto them. The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. It's not a matter of if there is brokenness all around us. Listen, there is brokenness all around us, even in the midst of this congregation this morning. I have no doubt that there is brokenness in our midst today. So the question is not, is there brokenness that needs to be repaired? The question is, what will we do about the brokenness? Will we do something about it today? I want to talk to you, number one, about the responsibility of the call. We see that in chapter 2 and chapter 3. Nehemiah was confronted by the need. He was confronted by the brokenness. And he took a step of faith. And God blessed Nehemiah's step of faith. As a matter of fact, as we learned last week, Nehemiah was granted by King Artaxerxes a royal escort from Shushan to Jerusalem. Almost 800 miles it was from Shushan to Jerusalem. And the king gave him a royal escort. On top of that, we found out that Nehemiah was given all of the materials that he would need to facilitate the building of the wall and the building of the gates there in Jerusalem. Now Nehemiah has arrived in Jerusalem and he was confronted by the very thing that he had heard about. We see letter A, the brokenness. The brokenness. Look at chapter 2 and verse 17. Nehemiah said unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in. Notice these words. How Jerusalem lieth in waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Now, I want you to get this in your mind this morning. Jerusalem is no more, a, 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 it no longer rather resembles a city. It's broken down, it's burned, it's wrecked and torn and ravaged. And Nehemiah sees that Jerusalem lieth waste. 
The words lieth waste, one Greek, uh, one Hebrew word rather, that means to be desolate and ruined. How many of you saw some of the wreckage that that hurricane caused down in the Bahamas a couple weeks ago? I mean, whole cities that were just wrecked and destroyed. I don't know what Jerusalem looked like on that day when Nehemiah was there, but I imagine it was something like that. It wasn't an inhabitable, uh, inhabitable city. Uh, as a matter of fact, Nehemiah could not even get his... Uh, horse around some of the wreckage to go see how bad indeed it was. It was that bad. It was that broken. You can read about the brokenness in 2 Kings chapter number 24. We read of how Nebuchadnezzar came in and he ravaged Jerusalem and burnt down uh, the gates and destroyed the walls that were there in Jerusalem. We see the brokenness. Let it be. We see his blessing. I'm moving right along quickly. Verse 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. In spite of the brokenness that was very real, in spite of the brokenness of Jerusalem and the Jewish people, that was certainly significant. Nehemiah knew one thing. And the thing that Nehemiah knew, that in spite of the brokenness, he had God's blessing on his life. That's very, very important because he had God's blessing on his life. There was nothing and there was no one who would be able to stop him from the work that God had for him to do. I'm reminded of Romans 8.31 where Paul asked a powerful question. He says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Certainly there was brokenness. Certainly there was ruin. Certainly there was desolation in Jerusalem. The Jewish people were under reproach. But Nehemiah had the blessing of God. He had confidence because of God's touch and His blessing on his life. Someone may look at the broken culture in which we live. They may look at it and say, it's a wasteland. It lieth in waste. And they may ask you, how are you going to accomplish anything? How are you going to do anything about that? I remember uh, years ago now as we began to make the decision to launch out and come plant the church here in Los Angeles County, so many people out on the East Coast, they would say, Zach, why are you leaving North Carolina? Why are you going out to the left coast? You ever heard it called that? That's what they call it. <laughs> For good reason, I suppose. But so why are you going out to the left coast? I mean, man, they don't want anything to do with God. They don't want anything to do with church. They don't want anything to do with the gospel and the Bible. You know what? I can look back and say, hey, all I know is God's hand is on this. God wants us to move out there. God wants us to do that. And in spite of the brokenness, we need God's blessing. And when we have God's blessing, we can have boldness. That's letter C. Us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. In light of God's blessing, these people were prepared to build. They were prepared to do something great for God by His grace and for His glory. We understand not everyone was pleased with what Nehemiah and these people wanted to do. In fact, we see it in verse 19. We read about these men last week, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem. These were the men who were the opposition. They were scorning Nehemiah. They were scorning the people saying, what do you think you're doing? You can't build this wall. Uh, they were criticizing. They were skeptical of what the people were setting out to do with this call of God in their life. But may I say this morning that skepticism and criticism is the testing ground of our faith this morning. It's easy to have faith. When you're in church today, it's easy to have faith when you're surrounded by believers. It's easy to have faith when you have people who are encouraging you and motivating you. But listen to me, faith gets difficult when there are other people who begin to question your faith. Why are you doing what you're doing? Questioning your motives. Uh, you guys really aren't out here to do that. You just want to rebel against the king. Nehemiah and these people had to have a confidence. They had to have a boldness that came from the blessing of God that was upon their life. And we see their belief, letter D. Verse 20. Nehemiah speaks up to the skeptic. Nehemiah speaks out to the critic. This is what he said. Then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, He will prosper us. Don't you love that? Amen. That might even be the motto of our church here at Haven Baptist Church. Every skeptic, every critic may rise up and say all manner of thing against our church. You don't need to rise up and say the God of heaven, He will prosper us. Yeah, but, but Pastor Zach, it's 2019. People don't want to hear the gospel. People don't want to hear the Bible. People don't want to come to church. Hey, the God of heaven, He will prosper us. Amen. Amen. Oh, they had that faith. 
And I thought of this. The amount of confidence we have in light of skepticism and criticism will be directly tied to our awareness of our Creator. Hey, certainly the times are rough. Certainly the brokenness is real and it's all around us. But we have a big God who's able to build up the most broken thing. We have a big God who's able to do what other people cannot do. In fact, in Jeremiah 23, or rather Jeremiah 32, 26 and 27, the Bible says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, This is God speaking, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Look at this. Is there anything... Too hard for me. Amen. That was the God Nehemiah believed in. Yeah. Nehemiah saw the brokenness. Nehemiah saw the Jerusalem life waste, that it was that it was broken down, that it was destroyed. But Nehemiah had a belief. Nehemiah had a confidence deep in his heart that he had a God who was bigger than the brokenness all around him. And we better hold on to that. Amen. The belief. Man, the story is building. There's excitement. There's drama. There's tension. There's conflict. There are unique and bold personalities. I mean, you ever watched a movie like that? I mean, it's got you on the edge of your seat. I mean, it's like the perfect movie, and it's building and building and building. And, I mean, you're biting your nails. and I mean, you're just, like, focused on the movie, and you're waiting for this kind of climax to the movie. Well, that's kind of what we read in Chapter 1, Chapter 2. But then comes Chapter 3. What do you mean, Pastor Jack? Look at Nehemiah 3, verse number 1. I mean, like, we've got drama and opposition, all of this excitement that's happening, and here comes chapter 3. Now, I'm going to read the first 10 verses of chapter 3 quickly this morning. <clears throat> I want you to listen how exciting these are, all right? I say that, you know, jokingly, but listen to this. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest. They built the sheep gate. They sanctified it. Set up the doors of it. Even under the tower of Neah, they sanctified it. Under the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him built the men of Jericho. And next to them built Zachar, the son of Emery. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build, who also laid the beams thereof, set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz. Next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshezebel. And next to them repaired Zadok, the son of Baana. Or is anybody excited about this? This is exciting, isn't it? <laughs> and next to them, the Tokoites repaired. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Passiah, and Meshulam, the son of Besodeah. They laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, and the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Next unto them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite. I'm going to stop for sake of time, but you get the point. This is literally the entire chapter, uh, chapter 3. It's these people built this gate, these people built this part of the wall, and next unto them, this guy built this part of the wall, and next unto him, built this part of the wall. I, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have ever saw this. Amber and I, we love to go watch a movie. We used to go to the AMC here in uh, North Carolina, and I had the AMC app. And I don't know if you guys are like me, but when I go to the movies, I like to get that big drink that's about this big, you know what I'm talking about? And I, I, I always make the mistake of drinking way too much drink, and we get an hour into the movie, and you, you got to go, you know what I mean? And so you're like, I don't want to leave. I'm, I'm really into this movie. Well, uh, I hope this is appropriate. Nobody can defend it, okay? But, uh, but AMC developed this app called Run P. That's what it's called. I'm serious about this. Look it up if you think I'm lying. And essentially, what, what it is, is it tells you a section of the movie that is anticlimactic. I mean, it doesn't have much information. It's not super important to the rest of the story so that you can run, do your business, and get back without missing any of the story. Now, I gave you that illustration to say, if we're being honest, now don't get up on your pharisaical high horse and talk to me about how you get to Nehemiah chapter 3 and you go, yes, this is my favorite part. You know what we do when we see that? We're like, oh, here we go. This guy built that. That guy built, built this. This guy built, built that. I mean, we get to that point where it's like, okay, got to get through this. You know what I mean? But it sort of seems anticlimactic. But what I thought about is really what we read in chapter 3 is, don't miss this, an essential element to the story of Nehemiah. In fact, it may be the most important element of this story to this point. You know why? Listen. Because this is where the building begins. 
This is where the building begins. Nehemiah chapter 3 tells us the story of not a man, not simply Nehemiah, but it tells us the story of the next letter, uh, the body. Letter E, the body. The word body, uh, one definition means a group of people with a common purpose or function acting as an organized unit. And that is precisely what we find in Nehemiah chapter 3. Listen, please listen to me this morning. Nehemiah chapter 3 is not about one man. Nehemiah chapter 3 was not about uh, even some few men that we read about in two, uh, chapter 2 verse 12 who did the work. But it is about a combined team effort. Amen. And as a matter of fact, God set aside, listen, God set aside an entire chapter of the Bible to commemorate and to memorialize 39 men who got involved in the work. Now, I, don't have to, I was going to go through and read every one of their names, or at least give it a shot. But you can read about it. I've got the list if you want to. I'll send it to you. But 39 men in particular are mentioned in uh, Nehemiah chapter 3. These are men who rose up in the Word. And here's what we have to remember. And on Anniversary Sunday, I can't think of a more important thing to say to our church than this right here. Yes, God called Nehemiah, but he could not do the work by himself. He needed a team to come alongside to help him do the work. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4 talks about this. And I don't, again, for sake of time, I'm not going to read it. But Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12, the Bible talks about how God has given grace to every one of us. The measure of the gift of Christ. He's given you a gift. He's given you a talent. He's given you something to contribute to the work. This work is going to go forward. Listen, we believe that God has great things in store for Haven Baptist Church. We believe there's a lot of brokenness right outside the walls of this church that we want, by God's grace, to lean into, that we want to repair, that we want to build up for the glory of God. But listen, it can't be done by one man alone. It'll require a group. It'll require a body. It will require a team effort. I want you to notice letter F, the building. The building. We see the building in, uh, in verses th three, or rather verses one through thirty of chapter three. And there are two words that I want to mention to you uh, that are mentioned uh, again and again here in chapter three. And it's these two words you see on the screen: builded and repaired. Builded and repaired. The word "builded" is used three times in Nehemiah chapter three. Listen to this: the word "repair" is used thirty-four times in Nehemiah. Chapter three, 3. Clearly these two words are verbs. They define the action of the people in this building project. And when we consider the building of this wall, uh, in order for us to have proper context, we need to understand what kind of a building project this was. This wasn't just throw up a couple two by four. You know, this week we worked really hard to make this wall. But in the context of the week, it, it, it was about a week's worth of, of work. Wasn't a really, really major, big job. This was not the same kind of a wall, obviously, that Nehemiah and these men were building. In fact, I want to put a map up here of uh, the estimation of the wall that Nehemiah and these men uh, and others would have would have built. Now, a couple of things I think is, these are just fun facts. Man, I'm trying to rush so much, you guys. I'm trying to push through this really fast. we got food waiting on us. But stay with me as I go through this. DJ Klein estimates that the length of the wall around his perimeter to be about a mile and a half. Now think about that. A wall that is a mile and a half in its perimeter. That would be 7,920 feet long. How many think that's a pretty good sized wall? You agree with that? Amen. Not only that, it was a wall that would be 40, approximately 40 feet high and 8 feet deep. Now can you imagine building a wall that size? Not only did they have to rebuild the wall, but in Nehemiah chapter 3, we read about nine gates that were built along with the wall. The sheep gate, the fish gate, the old gate, the valley gate, the dung gate, the gate of the fountain, the water gate, the horse gate, and then this referred to as the gate Mithcat. While many times we can get lost in the dimensions and the amount of all this, these people, don't miss this, these people look beyond the grand scope of the project. You know what they did? Listen. They built the wall. That's what they did. They didn't stop and go, you know, it's going to be 7,920 feet long. 
It's going to be 40 feet high. It's going to be 8 feet deep. I don't know if we can do this. No. They said, you know what? I'm going to find my place. And I'm going to start building. Isn't that great? You, see, you look at the challenges that we face here in our church. And, and you can look at a million different things and think, man, that's going to be really hard. That's going to be a tough hurdle for us to get over. That's going to be a, a hard mountain to climb. But I want to tell you something. If you'll find your place, if you'll get involved in the work, God can help us to do a great and mighty thing here in this community. The Bible says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We see last of all the repair of the city. <clears throat> the repair of the city. In Nehemiah chapter 3, I actually believe we find the heart behind this massive project. You remember we, we would have a tendency to skip over Nehemiah chapter 3, but in it we find the very heart of the entire book of Nehemiah. I want to close this message this morning by giving you six words that I believe fuel this seemingly impossible building project. How could these people, more than 39, but at least 39 that are mentioned, how are they going to build a wall that is a mile and a half in perimeter, 40 feet high, 8 feet wide? Here's how. Letter A, diversity. Their diversity. Now, I'm going to hit these very quickly and be done this morning. But it, but. In Nehemiah chapter 3, if you read through it all, and I encourage you to do it, you're going to find out something. That the work that was done on this wall, the work that was done to repair this protective measure of the city, was done by different people. It was a work that was done by people with different positions. It was a work that was done by people from different places. But hear this. They all had the same purpose. Did you guys get all of that? I said they were different people, different positions, different places, but they had the same pers- uh, purpose. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse number 1 tells us, look at this, then Eliashib, it tells us who Eliashib is, the high priest rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. Now, think about that. The priests, the high priest. These were people who held sacred positions in the Jewish religion. And yet, these priests did not hold themselves to an unreasonable standard. You know what the priest said? Hey, there's a work to be done. I have a place in the work. Give me something to do. And the Bible says that they built the sheep gate. And interestingly, the sheep gate, as we find in the treasury of Scripture knowledge, is supposed to have immediately communicated with the temple and to have been called the sheep gate because the sheep intended for sacrifice passed through it. And so these priests worked in their particular place that would ultimately help them fulfill their calling as priests. Furthermore, I noticed this considering the diversity of this group. Nobody was excluded from the work. We read about 39 men. Would you look at verse number 12, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse number 12? Interesting verse. The Bible says, And next unto him repaired Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. Look at this. He and who? He and his daughters. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says that this man, uh, by the, this man by the name of Shalom, Worked on the wall of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. Very interesting. One uh, scholar said that this work crew of Shalom, the son of Halohesh, was unique. Possibly he had no sons, but his family still joined in the work through the labor of his daughters. You know what I'm talking about? So many times we look for that little scapegoat. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, I would help, but... And that's what, that's what this guy could have done. Well, I would help, but I don't have any sons, and so I'm just going to let somebody else do it. You know what I said? No. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Got his daughters out there and said, hey, let's get to work. Let's start building the wall. And that's exactly what the Bible says that they did. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and every one members one of another. I'm going to tell you something. If you look long enough, if you look hard enough, you'll find an excuse for not getting involved in the work. You will. The devil will be happy to give you ten excuses as to why you can't get involved. 
But you know what we need? We need you to get involved. Amen. In order for this ministry to continue, in order for us to, to go another two years, another 20 years, we need people <laughs> just like this uh, man, Shalom, who will say, you know what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We see the diversity, letter B. We see their delegation. <clears throat> their delegation, each group did the part that they had been delegated to do. Now, I need you to think about this with me for a minute. And I promise I'm hurrying. I'll go as fast as I can here. <clears throat> but some people had more prestigious positions than others. Let's just be honest. Like, if I'm Eliashib and I get to build the gate that the sheep for the sacrifice get to come in, I mean, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, like, that's got a lot of notoriety, like a lot of uh, significance to go along with it. What if you're Malachi? Malchiah in chapter 3 verse 14 was assigned, he was delegated to build something called the Dung Gate. Now, how many want to join the Dung Gate ministry? Anybody want to be a part of that one? I mean, come on. All, I mean, we're all like, Lord, please don't give me that one. Don't give me that one. Malachi, or Malchiah, rather, the Bible says his job was to build up the Dung Gate. Okay, so Eliashib's job dealt with sacrifice. Uh, Malchiah's job dealt with sanitation. Thank you for that laugh. I mean, that's what I'm feeling. I'm like, I want the job that has to do with sacrifice, not sanitation, right? Like, I want to be the one who stands on the platform in the spotlight, not the one who's uh, cleaning the bathrooms at the end of the day, you know? Like, I don't mean I say that. I'm just saying that's usually what we buy for. We want the higher rung on the ladder. I mean, but the Bible tells us here that there are different people who had different responsibilities. Uh, they said about this, the dumb gate, GodQuestions.org said that the dung gate exited out to a garbage dump in the Hinnom Valley. Okay? Then we find from Finnis Day, he said that probably more refuse was carried out to the general dump through this gate than through any other. Have I convinced anybody that you want to be a part of the dung gate ministry yet? All right. But here's the thing I want you to understand. Listen to this. Man, I could preach on this for a while again. I just got to keep moving. You know what Malchiah means? This is so good. The name Malchiah means my God is Jehovah. Now, do you think it's significant that the man whose name my God is Jehovah is in charge of making the dung game? You know what that tells me? Malchiah didn't care where he had to work. Put me at the fish gate. Put me at the sheep gate. Put me at the dung gate. As long as I'm serving my Lord, that's all that matters. Isn't that great? Man, that's the spirit we need. I mean, it was just, you know what? I know this is my place. I know this is my calling. And by God's grace, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Malchiah didn't get bent out of shape because he didn't get to build the sheep gate. He owned the fact that he had been chosen by God to build the dung gate. Do you know what he did? He went out and built it. He went out and built it. Black and he said this, there are no insignificant tasks in the Lord's work. Every job is crucial and it carries with it profound ramifications. Neglecting the smallest assignment may leave people vulnerable. Let her see. We see the dedication. Now I'm, I'm literally going to speak through the latter part here. In chapter 3, this is what we find. A diverse group faithfully fulfilling their job in the unique place that God had placed them. But furthermore, when they finish their job, we find that some look for more opportunities to get involved. Look at verse number three, uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, we read about a group called the Tekoites. And next unto them... The Tekoites repaired. So these people referred to as the Tekoites are working on their part in the wall. Now, jump down with me if you would to verse number 27. After them, here we go again. The Tekoites repaired another piece. Now, isn't that interesting? So whoever these guys were, the Tekoites, when they finished their part on the wall, they didn't go like, all right, got my part done, I'm done, and... Uh, you guys, good luck. Hope you can get it worked out the rest of the way. You know what they did? I love the dedication here. They finished their part of the job, and then they said, okay, is there anything else that needs to be done? I'd love to jump in and help out with that. Isn't that a great spirit? I love it. Man, that's what we need. If we're going to build a wall, if we're going to see God work through, uh, 
redeem lives and transform lives. We're not going to have this mentality that, you know, this is my part of the law. I'm going to build my part of the law. When I'm done, I'm going to stand here and wait for you to get done building your part of the law. We're going to have to be saying, you know what? Okay, I've got my part built. Now, can I help anywhere else? Is there anything else that needs to be done? Where else can I pitch in? Where else can I volunteer? Where else can I get involved? We see that their dedication, letter D, we see the detractors. Okay. <laughs> now, I do believe this is an important part. And I told you that these are six words that are the heart of the passage here in chapter 3. And a detractor is a person who disparages someone or something. So while we see the dedicated in verse 5, we also see some detractors in verse number 5. Let's see if I put it on there. Verse number 5. Here you have the Tekoites. They're the dedicated ones. And they repair. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. Do you know what the word noble means here? Famous, powerful, chieftain. You know who these guys were? The, the nobles? We're too good to get involved with this world. They were prideful is what they were. That's good for you peasants down there to build the wall, but we're not going to get involved because we're the nobles, we're the famous, we're the powerful, we're the chieftains of the city. Furthermore, if you study, you'll find in chapter 6 and verses 17 and 18, I'll flip over there very quickly, the Bible tells us that the nobles of Ju Judah, same guys, sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. Look at this. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arah. In other words, not only were these guys prideful, but as John MacArthur tells us, one of the reasons, one explanation, beyond just the laziness of the rich, is that these nobles had been pledged to Tobiah for personal gain. So these guys were consumed with pride, and they were consumed with personal gain. And therefore, they were like, we're too good for the work. The detractors. I hope we don't have any of those in here this morning. We see letter E, their decision. We're coming to a close here. I want us to note some important words in Nehemiah 3. These people made a very important decision. What was that decision that they made, Pastor? They understood that no one individual could do the work. But they needed each other. This is important. As a matter of fact, I don't have time to go through it all. But time after time after time. Go read Nehemiah chapter 3. And this is what you're going to hear. Let me read it out to you. Time after time. And next unto him, build it. And next to them, build it. And next unto them, repair it. And next unto them, repair it. And next unto them, repair it. And next unto them, the Tekoites repair it. Uh, and next unto them, repair it. And next unto him, repair it. And next unto him, also repair it. And next unto them, repair it. And next unto them, repair it. Are you getting a little bit of an idea of what's happening here? Listen. They're standing shoulder to shoulder to shoulder to shoulder. How do you build a wall? Uh, how do you build a wall that's a mile and a half in diameter? Here's how you do it: as you work side by side by side by side. They made a decision to work together. We see, last of all, their dependence, and we actually find this in chapter three and verse number one. And I want you to know that from the outset of this important. Big project. These people acknowledged their absolute dependence upon God. Now, you might miss it if you just read it, so let's go back and study it just briefly. Chapter 3 and verse 1, we're back to Eliashib and the priests as they're doing their part. And the Bible says that they rose up uh, and they built the sheep gate. But look at these next three words. They <coughs> sanctified it. Mark those words in your Bible. The Holman Study Bible said... That these three words, they sanctified it, marked the beginning of the endeavor and emphasized the priest's dependence on God for the successful completion of the project. Hey, all I'm saying is this. You say, Pastor, you want to see this church go forward? Man, I do. You want to see this church grow? You want to see us knock out some walls? You want to see us expand our ministries and, and have more children's uh, ministry opportunities and, and have more outreach opportunities? Man, I want that to happen. But look at me. It will not happen apart from our God. Amen. Amen. We must be dependent upon Him. 
you know what? I want to be a better leader. I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better communicator. But I'm going to tell you what, if I become a better leader, a better pastor, and a better communicator, but I forget about my dependence on God, I will become a massive failure. We need Him. I close this message by singing this song, I Need Thee Every Hour in 1872. And it goes like this. I need Thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like Thine can peace afford. I need Thee, oh, I need Thee. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. Do you know the chorus saying it? I need thee, oh, I We need your direction. Lord, we can have talent, we can have ability, we can have all those things. But more than anything, we desperately need you. So I pray this morning that we'll rise up as a church. This was a church message. A message that's geared right for our church on this anniversary Sunday. We want to rise up in building. Not necessarily the structure of this building, although that might be one facet of it. But Lord, we want to see you rebuild lives, redeem the broken, the, the, the ones who are downtrodden by sin. And so Lord, in order for us to do that, we need each other. But more than we need anything, we need you. And so we ask you that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would use us for your honor, use us for your glory. And I pray, Father, for everything that's said and done, for all that we do, that you'll receive the honor and the praise and the glory for you alone are worthy. With every head bowed and every eye closed, we're about to be dismissed. But you say, Pastor, at some point in that message, God spoke to my heart down with my head just to testify that God did a work in my heart. Would you do that right now? However God spoke to you, do that as he handed all over the prison. Let's respond to the Lord now. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I don't know that I'm saved. I've never become a believer. Today is your day of salvation. The Bible says that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Father, I pray you'll continue to minister to our hearts. Bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.